Hello again. In this video, we'll be taking a look at the last item we need to complete our chemistry discussion. This is Organic Compounds Part 2. We'll be focusing in this video on two main ideas, proteins and nucleic acids. As we come in, we get our first look at proteins. These tend to have four main chemical elements and occasionally a couple of others. They always have carbon and hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen. Sometimes we'll see some sulfur here as well as some phosphate. Typically, proteins are going to be polymers. They're going to be long chains, and the monomer here are amino acids. There are actually 20 different kinds of amino acids, and I'll show you a couple of examples here in just a moment. But they're linked together uh, to make these long chains, these long polymers, by uh, covalent bonds that are called peptide bonds. They always contain an amino group and an acid group. So we'll take a look at the amine group and the acid group as we get into some pictures here in just a moment. Uh, proteins are interesting in that they can act either as an acid or a base, uh, and they're all basically identical except for one little component on each of the 20 amino acids that varies. Uh, and that would be what we would describe as a variable or an R group. As we look at the next figure, the uh, R group, the variable group, is going to turn up in green. So looking at this page, we see on the extreme left a generalized amino acid. I want you to kind of focus on the left, and I'm going to point out that all amino acids have three basic things in common. Uh, actually, four basic things in common. They all have a carbon in the center. So right here is our central carbon, and there will be things attached to this, to the left, the right, the bottom, and the top. Off to the left, we see a nitrogen with two hydrogens. That's our amine group, sometimes called an amino group. Off to the right is something we actually saw when we were looking at fats. This carbon double bonded to an oxygen with an OH attached, that is a carboxyl group, sometimes described as an acid group. Uh, the other thing that you see that these will always have is there will be dangling down on the bottom in this part of the picture a hydrogen. What I've just described for you and what is showing in the orange oval here is the basic framework for every single amino acid. The one place where they can vary is what's sticking off the top. And what's sticking off the top is often described as an R group. Now that can vary. As we go across the page, all of these amino acids, and these are real names for amino acids now, have these pieces in common. That's why it's in the orange oval. Where they're different, and that's what I'm going to focus on now, is the R group. Glycine, the simplest amino acid, has a very simple R group, and that's just a hydrogen. So we come over to aspartic acid, that gets a little more complex. Coming over to lysine, you can see it's got even a different R group. And over on cysteine, still different. Again, there are 20 variations. We'll talk about these a little bit more in another chapter. But these are some good representative examples of amino acid structure. I want to show you on this next slide how these will link together. Um, looking at the two amino acids on the left, they're not going to bother to tell us what the R group is, but we really don't care. I want you to see how these things interact with each other and make a bond. We're lined up head to tail. Notice that the carboxyl group of the amino acid on the left is lined up next to the amino group of the amino acid on the right. And focus in right about here, and I bet you anything you can guess what's going to happen. We have a OH highlighted on the molecule on the left, and a hydrogen highlighted on the molecule on the right. OH and H are the parts to make what? Yeah, if you guess water, you're right. So we're going to disassemble those. That's going to leave the carbon that's right about here wanting a bond, because it lost the bond that it had to the OH group. It's also going to leave the nitrogen over here wanting a bond. Well, we have a neat little solution for that. We make them bond together. And you can see over on the other side of the page that here's our new bond. This is a peptide bond. This slide uh, is basically a link to an animation. And I'm going to tell you that I'm going to pause here and have you go over and watch the animation in the study area on mastering. Before I pause, let me remind you how to get there. Let's go over to uh, mastering. When you get here to Mastering, again, remember to click on the Study Area, which you can see right here. 
and when you click that you'll come to this area again you have to choose the chapter I've already chosen it for you you need to click go that's already been done but right in here we see the uh, series of animations watch the animation on protein structure and when you're done I'll be here waiting on you okay we're back hopefully you've watched that and we're going on to our next slide uh, and I'm going to walk you through some of the things you saw. Oh, lo and behold, look there. There's another video for you to watch as soon as I finish this little section. We're going to talk about primary structure. In primary structure, we have amino acids lined up one after another, after another, after another, just like beads in a chain uh, or beads in a necklace. Primary structure is the sequence that amino acids are arranged in in a particular protein. Um, again, I'm going to have you uh, watch the animation at the bottom of the screen by going over to the study area on mastering. But before you do that, I want to read off that bottom white line in what would be something like primary structure. Uh, as we look at it, of course, it says animation colon primary structure. But if I were to read that in what would be protein primary structure, then it would be capital A N I M A. T-I-O-N colon space capital P-R-I-M-A-R-Y space S-T-R-U-C-T-U-R-E. Now, that's a weird way to read that, but was I accurate? Yes. Primary structure in a protein is effectively reading off exactly which amino acids are next. Something like leucine, glycine, proline, threonine, on down the list, and reading what effectively each bead is. So, now, you go over to the study area. Watch this little animation. I'll be here waiting when you get back. Well, welcome back. Let's go on to our next slide. This slide is a look at secondary structure. In secondary structure, we have a, a couple of possible arrangements we can see here. One is called an alpha helix, and the other is called a beta pleated sheet. All right, what I want to show you here with this camera is uh, some magnets. This is basically just a string of magnets. Uh, forgive the autofocus there, but it'll pop in every once in a while. And these um, snap to each other. Uh, we started with a simple string, and if you see here, I'm coiling them into a nice little tube. This is very much like secondary structure in a protein. In fact, what I'm making here is exactly like a uh, helix. Uh, we started with a single strand, and as you see there, it was a single tube. Now, the pleated sheet is like a fold where the edges are laid side by side by side, and it makes what was described nicely on that screen as a pleated sheet. And you can see there that that single chain just goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So those would be the two main shapes we would see with primary structure was the uh, coil or tube, which is a plate, which is a helix, and this flat sheet, which is accurately called a pleated sheet. And back here, let's continue with that discussion. Again, please go watch the secondary structure video or animation over on the study area. Now, tertiary structure is what we have when we look at the final finished assembled protein. There will be some coils or uh, or helices, there will be some flat plated sheets in there, and it gives an individual protein its uh, final shape. The next structure level actually requires more than one protein. It's quaternary structure, and we see in this particular image two separate proteins fitted next to each other. Think of something like a couple of keys on a key ring. The shape of a key is certainly unique, but two keys hooked together on a key ring is, is another level of shape. Proteins can be either fibrous or globular, and their names are actually very descriptive. Fibrous ones tend to be long strands. Globular tends to be more of a uh, little uh, knot type structure. Fibrous structures are uh, fibrous structure proteins are most common structural. They're strand-like. They don't dissolve in water. They're very stable, and a lot of them have this three-dimensional quaternary structure, and they provide things like structure and support. Uh, to the cell. Lord, I said the word structure a whole lot of times there, didn't I? Um, forgive me. Anyway, examples of fibrous proteins would include things like keratin, elastin, and collagen, which collagen happens to be the most common protein in the body, and some contractile fibers that we would find in muscle like actin and myosin. 
Globular proteins, on the other hand, are more like little knots, and they tend to be more functional. Uh, they're more compact, they are often spherical, they tend to dissolve well in water, and they are terribly sensitive to environmental changes. Heating them up, changing the acid level, uh, is not something that they're happy with. We'll have that discussion a little bit later on. They uh, have a tertiary or quaternary structure, a three-dimensional shape that is typically critical to their function. And a part of that three-dimensional shape of these proteins is an area that is referred to often as an active site. It's a functional region on the protein. And I'll go back to an example I used a moment ago. Think of a key, like a car key or a house key. If you were to take that key and put it on a grindstone, a motorized grindstone, and grind away for a while at the teeth on that key, oh, say for maybe 10 minutes, how effective would that key be at its original intended purpose after that grinding? Kind of pretty much not at all, because you ground away what would be the active sites on that key. So proteins, globular proteins, often have these shapes on them that are critical to their function. Good examples for this would be things like antibodies, hormones, some special proteins called chaperones, as well as some enzymes. Uh, when proteins have a critical shape, then we become very concerned that they keep that shape. And if we ruin that shape in one particular way, we have denatured a protein. And it's often described as unfolding them. These globular proteins are folded in particular ways. Think back to a moment ago when I had those magnets on screen and think to when I curled them into a spiral or uh, folded them into a flat sheet, those shapes were very definite and could be part of a functional area or an active site. And if we were to lose those, if I were to crumple up those magnets, for instance, they would not have that proper shape anymore. The active site gets destroyed and the protein's function will no longer work. That's most commonly in the body caused by a change in pH or a change in temperature. Um, it's commonly reversible in the body if we can get back to normal conditions, but it can be irreversible if the changes are extreme. Um, cooking an egg is a good example. You can't unfry an egg. You have overheated it, and the proteins in that egg white have severely changed at that time. We're going to focus for just a moment on a class of proteins described as chaperones. Chaperone proteins tend to be globular. Uh, they are good at one particular job. They help proteins that are being formed to fold properly and associate with other proteins. Uh, they prevent incorrect folding. Uh, they help in moving some proteins into or out of the cell. And they also promote proper breakdown of damaged or denatured proteins. And they're also involved in triggering an immune response. One particular class of chaperones includes stress proteins. These are formed anytime you're in some sort of physiological stress, including oxygen deprivation or becoming overheated. And these are critical to helping a cell maintain as much normal function as it can when the cells are in stress. They can even delay aging by packing, packing up and patching up damaged proteins and helping to refold them into their proper configuration. Over the next few slides, we're going to look at a very special class of proteins called enzymes. Enzymes act as biological catalysts. and In other words, they help reactions run faster. Uh, they regulate and increase the speed of chemical reactions. And when I say they increase the speed, they can speed up reactions by several million times per minute. They're incredibly fast. Uh, this figure illustrates the idea of how quick a reaction would be without an enzyme or with an enzyme and how much energy is required. If you look at the left hand chart, we're going to take a couple of reactants and snap them together and if we do not have an enzyme it actually requires quite a bit of energy to make this reaction happen. On the other hand, look at the right side, we require much less energy if an enzyme is around. So enzymes speed reactions up and reduce the amount of energy required and yes, you figured it out I'm going to pause and send you over to watch the animation how enzymes work in the study area on mastering. So you go ahead, I'll wait here, and I'll be here whenever you get back. Great, good to see you back. And if you're not watching those, why not? That stuff over there will be on the test. So if you didn't watch it, go watch it, I'll wait. And we're back.
As we look at a functioning enzyme, there are actually two parts of that. A fully assembled, ready to work, turned on, ready to go enzyme is called a hollow enzyme, but it's not always started up and ready to go. A great thing to think of as you consider this is your car may be sitting outside in the driveway right now. Is that car sitting in the driveway in danger of starting up and running? Pretty much not, uh, because there's an important part missing and that would be the key. Uh, the part that is setting there, not running, main, made primarily a protein, is called an apoenzyme. So the apoenzyme is the main structural piece of an enzyme, and on its own, it's turned off. It gets turned on with a molecule known as a cofactor, or a coenzyme, uh, that literally act like keys to start up an enzyme. Cofactors tend to be simple. They're often little molecules or atoms of metal. Uh, coenzymes, on the other hand, are keys. They just tend to be fancy keys, and they often include things like vitamins. Enzymes are incredibly picky about what they work on. They are very specific for particular compounds that they're going to work on, and the things that they work on are referred to as substrates. A good example to, to understand this idea, uh, some enzymes digest food that you eat, and there are particular enzymes for specific kinds of foods. In other words, uh, carbohydrates have one set of enzymes that break them down, including molecules called amylase. Uh, more about that in a little bit uh, later on. And then there are other enzymes that don't break down carbs, but instead break down proteins. So that is one very broad example of the reality that enzymes are specific and work only on specific substrates. The name of enzymes usually ends in the letters ACE, so we'll hear names like lipase or polymerase or uh, peptidase, and that ACE ending is a great clue that you're looking at the name of an enzyme. And they're often named for the reaction that they cause to happen or the reaction that they speed up. Uh, what we would say there is the reaction that they catalyze. A good example would be enzymes like hydrolases or oxidases. Uh, on this next series of slides, we're going to look at the behavior of an enzyme. So let's kind of take this one piece at a time, and we'll start with the empty enzyme here on the left and the raw substrate material that it's going to work on. Notice there, there are active sites uh, that the substrate fit in, and here at this first step, we see that the enzyme has grabbed onto the substrate molecules. No change has happened yet, and we call this little moment in time the enzyme substrate complex. So no change has occurred, but we do have the substrate bound. Next, we're going to link them together. And now we've actually made a change. Uh, this happens to be a reaction we've looked at before. This is a dehydration synthesis. So you can see the new bond there in green. And an interesting thing about the uh, substrate at this point, it now no longer fits into the enzyme, so the last step is it's released. And I want you to look closely at the enzyme. While the substrate has been changed, those two pieces were linked together, uh, and they no longer fit, so they jumped out. The enzyme itself is not changed at all, and it's ready to do this reaction again. Now stop and think for just a moment. What kind of reaction just took place? Was it synthesis or decomposition? We made a new bond, so it's synthesis. Would you call this an anabolic or a catabolic reaction? Remember, catabolism breaks old bonds. Anabolism makes new bonds. This is an anabolic reaction. All right, that finishes our discussion of proteins. Let's move on and talk about nucleic acids. We have two main nucleic acids, and at least one subtype we want to talk about, and these would be stuff you probably are familiar with at least a little bit, DNA and RNA. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA is ribonucleic acid. These are the biggest molecules in the body. When I say that, I'm not joking around. If you were to take the DNA from one single cell in your body and unravel it all, it would be very hard to do, but uh, at least it's theoretically possible, stretch it all out. Make your best guess about how long the DNA is from one single cell, not all the DNA in your body, but just the DNA from one single cell uh, stretched out end to end would be about six feet long. So when I tell you these are large molecules, that's what I mean. They are the largest molecules in the body. Uh, chemically, they're a little bit similar to proteins. They're going to have 
carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen, and they also have phosphorus. You don't see sulfur in there. We did see sulfur in some proteins. They're definitely polymers. These are long chains. Uh, the monomer, the individual piece that they're made of, we would call a nucleotide. Pictures of that in just a moment. Uh, and the nucleotide is hands down the most complex of all the monomers. It actually is composed of three separate parts. There is a nitrogen containing ring that we call a base. There's a pentose or five carbon sugar and there's a phosphate. We're going to consider DNA first. We'll come back and get RNA a little bit later on, but DNA has four different types of nitrogen rings or nitrogen bases. Uh, two of them uh, are double ringed and we would call those adenine and guanine sometimes abbreviated A and G and two of them are single ringed and those are called pyrimidines properly named here we have cytosine and thymine often called C and T there is a rule that tells how these pair up with each other because they do they pair up on uh, either sides of the DNA ladder uh, and they always pair with the same partner A always pairs with T and G always pairs with C. And as long as we're making DNA, those two rules will hold true. Uh, a does not pair with T when we're making RNA because that's another beast, and I'll talk about that when we look at RNA. But uh, as long as we're making DNA, these rules hold true. A pairs with T, T pairs with A, G pairs with C, and C pairs with G. You've heard it before, but DNA often is described as looking like a ladder. Uh, it is like a ladder that's been twisted, so we would call this a double helix. The backbone of DNA is the pentose sugar deoxyribose, uh, and it provides instructions for making proteins. That literally is all DNA is, is a recipe book, if you will, for making all the proteins in your body. It has to be copied every single time your cells divide in order to make sure that all your genes are in each new cell that you make. Here's a picture of what DNA looks like. We have a close-up on the top of the screen at two of these nucleotides, adenine and thymine. And if you look at the uh, lower left picture, you can see this twisted spiral nature of the shape. And you'll also notice that we have a backbone that is, uh, let's call it light pink and purple and light pink and purple and light pink and purple. Every time we have that light pink area, which is right here, we have a sugar, and this happens to be deoxyribose, and then that dark purple band would be a phosphate. Notice that at each sugar molecule on either side of the backbone, we have a base attached, either A, T, C, or G. Also notice a couple of other things. A's are always attached to T in DNA. C's are always attached to G. But look a little closer. Are the A and the T attached in the same way as the C and the G. They're not. There are two hydrogen bonds between A and T and three hydrogen bonds between C and G. The picture on the right is a uh, three-dimensional image showing roughly what this would look like in three dimensions. RNA is a little different and I guess there's an animation for you to watch on DNA and RNA over in the study area. Go watch that and I'll come uh, I'll be waiting here for you when you get back. All right, welcome back. RNA has four bases, much like DNA, but there's one subtle change. We have adenine, we have guanine, we have cytosine, just like in DNA, but notice there's no thymine. Instead, we have uracil. So here, G still pairs with C, but A now pairs with U when we're making RNA. The five carbon sugar here is not deoxyribose, instead it's ribose, so ribose goes with RNA. This is a single-stranded instead of a double-stranded molecule. Imagine having a long ladder, maybe a 10-foot, 20-foot long ladder made of wood that you cut in half right down the middle with a chainsaw. So the long halves have now been cut in half and the rung that you would step on uh, is now half a rung. Uh, that's the shape that you would have for RNA. There are three varieties of RNA. Actually, there's a few more, but we'll talk about three varieties of RNA, and each of them helps DNA make protein. Those three varieties of RNA would be messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA, and notice that they're abbreviated with a little letter uh, in the front of RNA that tells which type we have. In other words, messenger RNA would be mRNA, transfer RNA would be little t RNA, and ribosomal RNA would be little rRNA. We'll talk about those 
in more detail in a chapter still to come. The last of the nucleic acids we're going to talk about is ATP. ATP effectively is the rechargeable battery, the chemical energy in the cell. Uh, energy is trapped in nutrient molecules like glucose and we retrieve that energy in the form of ATP. Uh, this stuff directly powers chemical reactions in the cell. Uh, energy from ATP is immediately usable by all cells of the body and we're going to take a look at the structure of ATP. It's a good look at the structure of uh, most nucleotides. Uh, there is an adenine containing RNA group and uh, extra phosphates on it. So look at the picture on this page and I'm going to walk you through kind of one piece at a time. If we have the uh, nitrogen containing base which is adenine and we add a sugar onto it, ribose, then we have adenosine. If we add one phosphate onto that, we have adenosine monophosphate. If we add a second phosphate onto that, we have adenosine diphosphate. And look for just a minute, I'm going to zoom in right at this bond between the first and the second phosphate. Notice it's drawn as a little red squiggle. That indicates that this is a high energy bond whose energy can be released by hydrolysis. Uh, finally, if we put the third phosphate on, we actually have adenosine triphosphate or ATP and of course the TP part stands for three phosphates. What does this ATP stuff do for us? Well, first of all, it can donate that last phosphate in a process known as phosphorylation. That third phosphate can be transferred over to other molecules and effectively act like energy. That is the energy that this thing has to deliver. These are sometimes described as primed or charged and ready to do work. What sort of work gets done? Well, let's take a look at the three examples on this page. The first shows transport. What we see here is a molecule in the membrane of the cell that's often described as a pump. And when phosphate gets added, uh, that changes the shape of the pump and then the phosphate gets released. So the blue particle that you see there has been carried from inside the cell to outside the cell using the energy from ATP. Look at the middle example. Uh, ATP can help the body do mechanical work and in the example we see here we have a smooth muscle cell going from relaxed to contracted. The third example is doing chemical work. We're going to snap the two parts A and B together and we need energy to do that and that energy comes from ATP and you can see here that the phosphate is transferred from ATP to the A which lets it then join to the B molecule and we've made a new bond using energy from ATP. This is the moment you've been waiting for. This finishes chapter two. This finishes the material for our first major exam. So you've got a lot of studying to do. Uh, I encourage you to spend a lot of time with not only these videos but your own notes, uh, work you've done on mastering. Um, it's time. Go get ready for your test. Thank you. See you soon.